Hello and welcome to episode eight of Engaging Internal Comms. This is the podcast for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. Hello, my name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. So we're eight episodes into the show and I hope you've been able to listen to uh, the earlier episodes that we've got. So one to seven available on iTunes and also on our website, engagingic.com. Next week, we've got a great interview coming up with Ryan Tamasebi, who's from an organization called Hive, who will be telling us all about how we can use data to drive employee engagement. So really interesting conversation that I had with Ryan and I'm looking forward to uh, playing that to you and letting you hear that one. Um, If you've not already been across our website, uh, please do so. Please sign up to our mailing list. Also, please give us some feedback on the show. Really, really, really keen to find out what you're thinking about it. Is it is it hitting the right buttons for you? Is there anything we need to be doing differently? Any any uh, different topics that you'd like to be hearing about that are hot on your agenda at the moment? Really like to be, make the show as relevant as possible. And on that note, we do have a link, a community on Facebook where uh, you can join our private group. You can do that via our, our website as well, engagingic.com. We also have a Facebook page where we are posting uh, snippets from upcoming interviews that we'll be playing in the following weeks. Anyway, so hopefully we can hear back from you, get some engagement from you and find out how you're finding things. So anyway, on to today's interview. One of the areas I've been looking to explore for a while now is the whole area of measuring internal communications, which is something that everybody in the internal communications and employee engagement space is really keen to do. It's it's something that's been pressed and pushed for for a while now in terms of being able to prove value added and return on investment. So in the today's uh, conversation, we're going to be looking at, at the whole idea of can you measure uh, employee engagement and internal communications and particularly internal communications, um, but also what are some of the myths associated with with that attempt to measure it and what are some of the things we need to be watching out for. So I think this is going to be a really interesting interview for those of you who are working in internal comms, but also an employee engagement as well, who are being pushed to deliver that return on investment that is expected from our organisations and how we can be mindful of some of the pitfalls of going down that route. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to Sarah Carr, who I met at the IOC, IOIC conference in Manchester in 2019. Sarah is an experienced internal communicator. She's worked for Aviva for the last 18 years, and Aviva is a savings, retirement, and insurance business. And I'll ask Sarah to tell us a little bit about Aviva in a moment. Um, Sarah describes herself as someone with a passion for data and measurement and finding the nuggets that really help understand the people we're communicating to and how best to reach them and that's what we're going to be talking about today this the idea of measurement and also some of the myths around measurement and um, during the time with Aviva Sarah's worked in in HR which she describes as the dark side and we're going to be talking about that in a moment um, <laughs> uh, and in global internal communications and now for the last three years uh, Sarah has been global communications insights lead so hello Sarah how are you? I'm great. Thanks, Craig. Thanks um, for uh, inviting me on. It, well, thank you for for, for, for agreeing. It's, it's lovely to speak to you. And I think you're you're based in, in York, aren't you? Or round about the York area? I am. Yeah. Sunny York. Yes. Not New, not New York, but Old York. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. And I prefer the Old York to the New York, if I'm perfectly honest. <laughs> so Global's Com, Global Comms Insight Lead. Tell me, what, what does that what does that entail? What does that what's that job actually involve, Sarah, just for our listeners, please? It sounds really fancy, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, for anyone who's not familiar with Aviva, um, as Craig said, we're an insurance company we've got an investments arm um and at the moment we have around thirty thousand people um based in different parts of the world um offering insurance and protection and investment products um to people so that's quite a quite a challenge in terms of of how you understand who all those people are what they all need to know and um, where my role comes into it is how do we know whether we're doing that effectively 
Um, and what can we find out about those people that helps us communicate to them even better? Um, wow. So yeah. it's it's that kind of uh, group head office, I guess, um, in old world terminology, um, a role that links in with the comms teams that we have in each of the different markets to help them bring insight to them um, from things like our annual employee listening survey, uh-huh. but also helps work with them um, to understand how our people interacting with the messages that they're, um, they're communicating. What can we learn from that? What are the ways that we can do things differently using our channels? What sort of content is most important right now? So it's a, a great role for someone who is as kind of curious and nosy as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, uh, how many, so 30,000 people is like a huge organization. Yeah. How many, so how many, so you, are, are they, are you've got local comms managers working in their business units in their markets? Um, yes. And you, and they're, I guess, nom- normally reporting into you or, or, or the dotted line? No, yeah. no. Yeah. yeah. So um, they, in the local markets, the comms leads would um, report up with kind of one foot in their, yeah. home business um, and one foot through into the people function um, right. which includes the comms team so yeah. Yeah. we they have really have two hats on you know thinking about how they can help drive that business forward through the communications that they're yeah. doing yeah Oh, that's fantastic. So you've got that kind of strategic overview of what's going on in all the different markets in the business units and really helping kind of make sure there's some consistency but also I guess like sharing best practice that, that sort of thing around the business as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the comms leads in, in the different markets are all absolutely brilliant. And, mm. you know, they, they come to it with different perspectives based on kind of the challenges in their business areas at the moment. Um, mm. There's cultural nuance. There's all kinds of things that because they're there and part of it, they, you know, are absolutely best placed to be right in amongst all of that. Um, and I guess what I can bring to the party to help them is um data that helps them see what's happening because of all their kind of blood sweat and tears that they're putting Mm. into it and Mm. how does that compare to what's happening in that market over there and then you know helping look for those opportunities where we can join things up and do it once or we can learn from each other and and do things differently yeah so, so I know you measurement, you, you, and you, you self-acclaimed love of data and measurement, and that was what you were talking about when, yeah. I, when I first met you. So, and you, you talked about the seven myths of measuring internal comms, which I think is really interesting. Just, just before we dive into that, though, so measurement, um, and what is it? What is it for you that's so critical about? Uh, and I guess you know, I guess many of the people involved in in, in internal comms will know that that, in, that that measurement is one of those sort of things that everybody is trying to strive to to be able to sort of pr- prove that return on investment, but what what was it for you that really captured your attention when it came to measurement? Was it a particular experience that you had or just a combination of experiences in, in, your, in your internal comms career? Oh, good question. I think, yeah. um, so I, I grew up in a family where both my parents had a small business that they ran between them. So right. they would often talk about work related things um, mm. in the house and you kind of pick up on that stuff. Um, and before I joined Aviva, I'd only ever worked for small organisations. Um, and in, in a business where there's five people or ten people, you have to be really confident before you spend money on something. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to know that the thing that you're doing is going to benefit your business because otherwise, you know, it could make the difference between your business not being there tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it's that kind of commercial mentality that's always made me question what are we doing how do we know it's the right thing how will we know if it worked or not Mm. um and that I think is kind of the underlying reason as Mm. to why I can't I can't be okay with somebody saying let's do this thing we'll spend this money on this project the end like but why? <laughs> I, I <laughs> yeah. need to understand, you know, what is what is the benefit that we anticipate because of that? And how do we know that that's the right thing? And how will we know we've achieved that yeah. benefit or not? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I think that's really important. And in any, any, um, 
any what what how you would maybe describe it you know non fee earning role if you're in a, in a in a in a in a part of the business where there isn't that you know direct correlation always that really clear direct correlation between what you do mm. and and the bottom line and I remember I mean I used to work in I used to work for Pepsi um, that was my last kind of pep corporate job and my job would be similar to yours I was you know working with um, it was more in an L&D perspective, but working with learning and development people in the, in the business units, kind of coordinating mm. their work. And I always used to think, how many cans of Pepsi have, have, have need to be sold today to, to, for me to pay for my wages to do what I'm doing? And I'm not actually yeah. selling anything or making anything. And I always had that. And I think that, you know, again, I've got my own business. It, it's, a, it's a useful thing to, you know, not to be questioning of your value but to questioning the value you're adding and being really mindful of that I think is a really good quality to have and particularly in a big corporate because it's very easy to just sort of you know get lost in that sea of of, of you know uh, overheads isn't it and, and to, and to yes. just think well there's loads <laughs> of others so why why not me <laughs> but uh, okay so let's let's get into the nitty-gritty then so these seven myths that you talked about at um at the, at, and we probably haven't got time to go through all of them um but I just I, pick my favorite yeah well that's probably yeah <laughs> and I may, it might be worth just just going through you know bullet pointing and we'll put them into the show notes so people can who want to read them and, and can't remember them but but, but do, you, do you want to just quickly whisk have you got them to hand or can you, you remember? yeah fab if you want to just whisk yeah. through them and then maybe pick one or two that really you know for you have been are the most sort of well not, not I think they're all significant but the one that maybe you you know you've got the, the most stories around so I'll, over to you the seven myths okay <laughs> <laughs> so um the seven myth came about because um I volunteered um to speak at, at an IOIC um get together and mm. I was trying to think about you know it's one of those things, isn't it? Communicating to a room of communicators. There's a bit of pressure in that. So. <laughs> um, but actually, in kind of that prep and thinking it through and deciding to to talk about it as myths, it did make me realise that I think there are some, um, some myths that really do prevail in kind of comms conversations when I get out to, to internal comms get-togethers. Um, so, yes, hopefully they're helpful. I'm sure they so definitely the first, are. <laughs> <laughs> so the first myth um, that I like to talk about is um, that the people on the stage have all the answers, or in this case, that the people on the podcast have all the answers. <laughs> um, <laughs> because, you know, the bottom line for me is that um, there's always more you can learn. Mm. So there's a, a brilliant quote from Doug McMillan at um, Walmart, who's the CEO there for a while. He said, almost everything I've ever done has been copied from someone else mm. and that I think absolutely refreshing honesty really sums up for me what I think um well what is kind of an ethos about life um, yeah. but particularly about you know the the way that we go about doing things in comms and the way that we can go about measuring them um because if we're curious and people listening to this podcast would fall into that bracket because they're yeah. you know, listening to it for the purposes of finding out something new um so yeah not believing that you have to think up the solution and invent everything yourself yeah. and instead just being interested and open and collecting up wisdom i think is the, the best approach yeah and I took from that as well is that there's also that there's you you, you 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 can always learn more you know and I think we put people on a stage and on a pedestal and sometimes think right you know they have all the answers and they have all the knowledge but it's yeah. not always the case and we we sometimes fall into the trap of being seen as the font of all knowledge when actually we're do you mean there. you're not the font of all knowledge Craig? I'm certainly not no, no. <laughs> I cura I, I'm definitely a curator of other people's knowledge that's why I, that's why I interview people like you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so that's the first one people on the stage yeah. that have all the answers what, what's the second of the seven myths so myth number two is that the best comms are epic and award-winning mm. um and i don't have an issue with awards they're lovely mm. um i've been to some award ceremonies i really enjoyed them but the i guess this boils down to what i was saying before about what are you doing why are you doing it how do you know it's going to work sometimes the best way to achieve your outcome is really ordinary and you've done it a hundred times before and it might just be that an email out to all employees and some posters on the toilet door 
is the thing that that does the trick um yeah. so i guess it's that reminder to um myself and everybody in comms roles that there there are lots of exciting things out there but when you find yourself looking for an opportunity to use the exciting thing it's probably the wrong way around so you could use augmented reality to communicate anything you wanted um but really we should be starting from the outcome that we're trying to achieve and then working back through you know what is the best way to achieve that outcome for that audience and it might be augmented reality but let's not start with that (laughs) I, I think in, I'm, I'm going to be interviewing a guy in a few a few weeks uh, who's written a book around this, and it's really interesting. Which is the you know particularly now in this day and age, there's so many short, uh, lots of messages being bombarded with bombarded with communication all the time. And what he or he's mm. talking about is how you cut through that and with something that's really simple. And it reminded me of when we used to communicate with people in, in the factories. I used to work at the PepsiCo. One of the ways, the fa- most effective ways we found. It was just a little, a little like menu stand on the canteen tables, and and they would read that because at that time they're usually eating on their own. They didn't have anyone else to talk to. They're always looking for something to read. They would even read the, you know, the little uh, adverts, the leaflets that fell out of the free newspapers that people left on the table. They would sit and read anything. And for us, that it was just yeah. an obvious place to put messages that we wanted them to pick up. And 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 you know, you wouldn't probably win an award for that, but it was just effective and it worked and it cut through the noise and it got to it got the messages into there. And so yeah I, absolutely i think simplicity is sometimes you know, effectiveness is not always is seen as being you know glamorous but it, 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 yeah. it can be effective and, and not award-winning so best comms aren't always awarding what's our third our third myth <laughs> the third <laughs> myth is that you should always trust your gut instinct <laughs> mm. <laughs> which is a really interesting one because i am quite instinctive i think in the way mm. that i approach things um yeah but um, previous to my life in comms and Aviva, um, I studied psychology and Mm. the concept of confirmation bias is just, I think, so super relevant. Mm. Um, So it's the super short version is that um, at any one point in time, your brain is receiving up to 11 million pieces of data. Mm. Um, And, obviously you can't consciously think about 11 million pieces of data all at once. So your brain just uses all of your collective experience and wisdom to kind of filter through and only deliver certain things into your conscious based on what it thinks are important to keep you alive, keep you safe. Um, So I guess the, the short version is there's an awful lot of stuff that's happening that you're seeing, that you're hearing, that you're experiencing that you're not consciously aware of. Mm. And I think that translates for me into um, comms and the work that we do, because you can set out to find a positive outcome or you can set out to find a negative outcome or you can set out to be really neutral Mm. um, and see what you find. And it's that trying to always bring yourself back to that middle point um, of being really careful how you phrase your questions, mm. looking for the opposite of what you believe to be true, um, just to test whether there is an alternate reality that your brain hasn't let mm. you see yet before yeah. you're confident that you've reached a conclusion. And that that in that because that's an interesting one from because of gut instinct, you could say sometimes is you know what you were saying earlier around measuring comms and measuring output of comms is that some people do make those decisions on based on gut instinct don't they yeah well they'll kind of go it just feels right you know there's that it it appeals to my reptilian brain and i can't articulate what which bit of it (laughs) i i i I, but i can't communicate that because it's so primitive so i I, yeah it's interesting to, to compare that with yeah but that's not you know we need to be we need to be able to give it a little bit more substance than just it just feels right but but it is interesting and your idea of investigating the opposite i guess is that provocation to say well yes your gut instinct's great but always just think what's the flip side and could that be better and am i is there a confirmation bias there that's that's yeah yeah and it's fun to do as well you know yeah yes it's it's a difficult thing often to measure your own comms because you have obviously made all the decisions along the way Mm. um, and therefore of course you believe you've done the right thing otherwise you wouldn't have done it because none of us are in this business to just you know make stuff up and see what happens away Um, so setting out to kind of investigate the opposite outcome um, it can be quite liberating Mm. in a way and in fact the opposite 
is a, an interesting way I find if you're doing a comms plan, if you're, if you're doing a comms plan and you're a bit stuck, mm. like how do I achieve this outcome? If you try and make a, an opposite comms plan of like how you could absolutely make sure that your outcome never happened. Yeah, yeah. You can reverse, <laughs> you yeah, can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can sometimes throw up some interesting stuff. You, you like, can, oh. yeah. I've used that when we, when I've been working with people with, you know, on sort of brain, you know, idea generation sort of thing. And when they're yeah. all, they're stuck, they're, oh, they can't, they've run out of ideas how to make it better. Then I, you know, well, how could you make it worse? And yeah. that just throws up a whole new plethora of different ways of looking at it and actually how can you make it worse and then reverse that again gives you a very different route to, to a different answer than just trying to make it better all the time. So it, I like that as an approach. Right, so we've got people okay. are on the stage of all the answers, number one. We've got best comms are always award winning. We've got three, always trust your gut, trust your gut instinct and in, in, investigate the opposite. What's number four? Oh, so number four is that you need lots of time and fancy tech to do Ooh. good measurement. Mm. Contra <laughs> controversial. I can hear people th slamming their iPods or phones to the ground. How dare? Well, so come on, tell us what that means. <laughs> so, yes, it's brilliant to have lots of time. And I, I absolutely recognise that, you know, my role is all about the the kind of the measurement, the insight and and putting that to work. And if you're in a role where you're a one-man band for comms or you're a smaller team you don't have the luxury of having somebody you know with time to pour over data and insight it is more difficult but you can absolutely do some amazing um, measurement in really simple ways so I always think back to innocent smoothies mm. and the story of how they came to be so the um the people behind Innocent Smoothies uh, decided to um, make some smoothies. And the way that they tested whether this was a good idea or not was um, just had two bins next to the stall that they were selling it at. And as they sold their smoothies, they asked people, do you think we should ditch our jobs and do this for a living? When you've finished your drink, either put your empty in the yes bin or the no bin. Mm. So it can be that simple, you know. Yeah. I agree. It's, yeah. Worth spending the time thinking about what you're going to measure and how you could do it and just making it as easy as possible for yourself to get to an answer. Yeah. I think there's something quite visceral and, and, and you know, cuts again, it's another thing that cuts through the noise. If you, It's great to have, you know, really great apps or, or and I'm a massive fan of, of tech, as, as I know you are as well. I know, I know yeah. you, know you say, but sometimes just having something very visual and, and visceral, you know, we, we used to do it again back, back in my Pepsi days with, um, uh, we, we, you know, we used to have like a, a charity thing in the reception area and people would, a bit like the, they're doing kind of John Lewis uh, or Waitrose where you put your little coin in the in the, the, the charity that you want to give your, your little charity donation to. It's very visible and you could see which, what people were passionate about and, and everybody could see where their contribution was in that. And, and that, I think sometimes that visibility and simplicity can be much more effective than something that's, that's high tech and, and more complex. So, Absolutely. We're on to number five. Sorry, go on. Yeah, go on. Say <laughs> no, it's, all, it's all right. I was just going to say one of my favourite ways to test something, particularly if it's, you know, something like um, financial results announcement days. Mm. If it's if it's a day where everybody should have found out about something, mm. this is obviously in the olden days when we used to work in an office, Craig, mm. instead of <laughs> being marooned at home. Um, <laughs> one of my favourite ways to, to kind of test how we've got on um, with getting those messages out is just to go and like when you go and buy yourself a coffee in the coffee queue try and ask 10 people like 10 strangers they mm. often look at you a little bit strangely but when you explain who yeah. you are most people are happy to answer and if you just say you know I just wondered have you heard about this yeah what did you hear what do you make of it yeah and then by the time you get back to your desk you've got a coffee and you've got a really good sense of you know a, a random slice of the organization and how they yeah, feel about yeah. what's happened or yeah. what they've heard absolutely no i i i'm I, again we used to ask questions around you know how, how do you how do you it used to be a question we'd ask in our annual it wasn't in a survey it was more in a kind of a like a focus group thing that we used to do just how do you find what's the best way to eat what is the way that you find out about what's going on in, in the organization or the factory yeah um, and that would tell us so much more than you know that simple question would would, would give us our there's the root conduits we need to use because that's obviously how people find out stuff and 
if it's the grapevine, then how do we influence the grapevine? How do we get messages into the grapevine that, that you know, how do we facilitate that? So anyway, we're on to number yes. five. <laughs> number five <laughs> is a good one. So the myth of, is that you should always measure everything. <laughs> Ooh, and that's from a self-claimed, a self-claimed <laughs> data and measurement uh, a lover. Nerd. So, yeah, <laughs> nerd. Yeah, yeah. So um, tell us what that means. So this is something I kind of learned the hard way. Um, so I absolutely set out to measure absolutely everything and had line graphs on line graphs and charts and bars and um, and then had a, a kind of moment of realisation where rewinding back to the what am I doing, why am I doing it, what will be different because of this. Um, if every time you measure something it gives you the same answer, you're mm. probably wasting your time measuring it. Mm. You could probably do that much less frequently um so i think the the kind of the golden rule for me is just don't measure what you already know yeah. so if for example you know that that um cus- stories about customers emotive stories told in the first person way always get good reads get good responses increase connection we don't need to to keep measuring that every month mm. we mm. might just you know keep a check on it so if we see any funny numbers coming up or if from time to time something feels like it might be different let's pop in and measure it again but don't waste your time because you can spend that time being curious about something else yeah 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 i think it's a case of asking yourself the question if we're going to measure it and we what are we going to do with the results and is it going to be any different to what we're doing now and if it isn't then why measure it in the first yeah. place it, it, it's like you say sometimes it's um it's that kind of reassurance or that well at least we're measuring it even though we've got yeah. no in, in, intention of doing anything about whatever we get back or, or not we haven't we, more often than not it's not the intention it's just we haven't got the resources or the bandwidth to be able to do yeah about it. so yeah that's it that kind of time machine you know imagine you've now completely delivered your piece of work you've got all those numbers in your hand what are you going to do with them and if, yeah. you, if you if you're not confident what use they're going to be to you they might not be the right measures. Yeah. Okay. Number six, we've got our penultimate, penultimate of the seven, uh, seven myths. <laughs> <laughs> so number six is, um, it's all about demonstrating return on investment. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is, I often hear, um, my fellow communicators talking about how do you demonstrate return on investments? Mm. And I think it's a really interesting one. And, a lot of this, I think, depends on the role that comms plays within the organisation that you work in. So there's always a lot of talk in comms about like the fabled seat at the table. Mm. Um, and I think that it's, it's easy for me um, to say, don't go too deep on return on investment because um, we are, you know, seen highly at Aviva, we've got... Uh, we're in a lot of those those conversations that help shape the organization we don't feel that we need to um be kind of defending our territory and making sure that people Mm. understand the importance of comms because they absolutely do but i think it's something that um drives a lot of people in other organizations that i've spoken to in the past um they measure because they want to be able to say look what we've done look at all the work we've put in look how important we are you know pay attention here um and i think a a different conversation which can help in a much better way is to sort of put that to one side and instead in those conversations with senior leaders rather than be bringing them the dashboard that that you believe is the kind of return on investment measure for your your work and the work of your department it's, if you can get into a conversation with them instead about how you can really help achieve, help them achieve their business goals, that is way more valuable to the organisation. It's actually much more valuable to them mm. because you could use an equivalent amount of time that you would have spent talking them through a dashboard which shows how many people have read, watched, done yeah. things and therefore, yeah. you know, pay attention, this is important, to being future focused about you know what is the stuff that we absolutely have to smash as an organization and how can 
all of our specialist skills, experience, knowledge and abilities help you to do that. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. I think I think it, it's a, it, it, as you say. I think you know this idea of a, a place at the table. It's really mm-hmm. it's about having the business acumen to know what. And it's like it's, I guess it, it, the parallel would say I would say is for us as an external business who you know gets brought in to help organisations or to work with organisations. It's one of the key things that we ask is, you know, how are we going to measure success? Not not just from a kind of you know likes and shares that sort of that sort of way, but actually yeah, what business results is this going to drive for you and what, yeah. what what's keeping you awake at night that the you know and, and the, the, I ask I only ask three questions so why this why now and why us and if you you know and, and so why you why do you want to why do you want to address this issue why do you want to uh, do it now and, and and why have you asked us to come and talk to you about it and through those three questions you can usually get some really good idea of how they're in their head is that their measures of success and and not then again it's not from a kind mm. of a a very simplistic measure. It's actually from understanding um, what, what what's, what's going to help their business and, and them to, to get through whatever it is that, that you're going to be working with them on. Right. right. I'm, I'm adding that to my collected do, wisdom. Do you like, oh, thank, well, <laughs> there you go. Thank you. I was, I've, I've, uh, that's nice to, nice to, I'm sort of tapping into all of yours. It's nice to give some back. So, uh, <laughs> right. Last one then. So we, we're number seven. Okay. Number what seven. Myth. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this is that comms is all about the fluffy soft stuff mm. um so all those things that drive us mad like oh it's it's just uh, can you just put this into like a pretty template or mm. you know can you take this message and put a bow on it and tell everybody about the cake sale tomorrow um so frustrating isn't it because mm. we could do any of those things but we've absolutely got the power to kind of make or break the organizations that we work in Mm. what you will find i think in any in any organization where you've got good comms people is that those people will know every corner of the business and see all the kind of connections they'll be able to tell you you know what what's working where which parts of the organization you know need more or or less from their leaders um and it's yeah, so it's inc- I think incredibly frustrating mm. when comms gets put into that uh, bracket of it's like marketing but internal. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I think there's a yeah. kind of I think there's a kind of an application of uh, I think sometimes that can be happen, can't it? And I, I I remember this from my corporate days is you know bring you people in just to wave your magic wand and you kind of do mm-hmm. this stuff to those people so and sort them out so we can then carry on doing what and then but it's that lack of ownership sometimes isn't it that you you, you know you need you need them to be uh, recognise that actually they're part of the solution as well the people who brought you in the leadership teams they, they've got to actually walk the talk on a lot of this stuff you can't just do what you do in IT isolation um, yeah I think that's, a, that's an important point. but I think actually I mean I mean we're recording this sort of summer 2020 and we've not managed to get through the whole thing without really talking about it but you know I think the fact is that over the last sort of t- 10 to 12 weeks with through the pandemic I think actually I think a lot of organizations have realized that it's actually a big business critical function uh keeping people in the loop and, and I just hope that yeah. continues when whatever normal looks like does return or, or, or whatever it's going to look like over the next six months uh, uh that, we, that, that we continue to value that that, that part of it and we spent some time earlier in the year sort of um, breaking down, so before any of this happened, mm. um, just breaking down, you know, what, what are the big things that we want to go after um, and, and really boiling that down into, you know, what is the business impact of doing that? So uh, one example would be, you know, we were thinking about, so thinking about our organisation's purpose mm. Um so why is it important that we help people understand what our purpose is and, and connect to it? Um, and we we concluded that that connection is what leads to just, you know, discretionary effort. So yeah. if people really believe that the work that they do for the organisation that they do it is important and makes a difference and, you know, plays an important role either, you know, in societally mm. or just in the lives of the people that they're doing that work for, they're much more likely to you know hang on for the extra half hour at the end of the day to resolve an issue or you know push through those kind of weird bureaucracy blockagey type don't know how to get this done barriers 
to get to those happy customers at the end of the day. Yeah. And if you've yeah. got happy customers, then they're going to stay longer. They're going to buy more. And that is where your business grows and succeeds. So it's finding, I think, those really clear routes through what we're doing and what is the, the end goal of mm. that for the organization and the, the people that we serve yeah. um, that helps you stop being blown off course um, and not let your precious time be absorbed into things that actually aren't going to help you achieve those outcomes. Yeah. 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 I agree. I mean, it's, um, it, it's the Dan Pink stuff. I don't know if you've come across that, but autonomy, mastery and purpose are the things that he says to drive engagement. I want to be able to have some direction over what I do. I want to have feel to be that I'm, I'm the best I can be at doing my job, but I also want to have a sense of purpose that what I do actually matters. And I think if you get those three things, right, it really, it really helps, um, you know, build that engagement and it takes it out of this, this sort of soft and fluffiness. Well, we, look, we said we were going to talk about, um, go back to the ones, but I think we've actually covered them all. I think we've had a good deep dive into all seven there. So, um, I just can't resist it, Craig. I just get all it. No, that's fine. No, 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 I think that's, I think we, I think that's good. I think I'm, I'm pleased that we, we, we didn't just sort of dance through all of them and then pick one or two. I think we, we, all of them are kind of equally important, I think. So just, just, just to sort of maybe bring things to a conclusion, you, you've had a really long successful career at Aviva. And, and, and as you probably know, in our profession, in, in many professions at the minute, having and that, that kind of loyalty with, with one organization and having a building a career with, with and not moving around loads of different organizations is, is, is might be more unusual than it used to be a few years ago so what is it about Viva and what is it how you've learned and grown with that same organization that anyone else who's looking to build a long-term career you know with it with an organization or looking to build a, a, an organization that has people who want to stay with it what any tips there in terms of your own personal experience and why Viva has been been a special part of your career for you Ooh, well I think the, one of the great things about Viva you know undeniably the people so um i've worked with and for some amazing people um and that i'm i'm a great believer in you know doing what makes you happy mm -hmm. and if you are surrounded by people that you feel you can learn from um and that you genuinely enjoy working with personally there might be a, a a job that's fantastic and pays twice as much money elsewhere but I think that's quite a lot to give up mm. um so there is something for me in the kind of just the pure hedonistic mm -hmm. just doing what makes you happy yeah yeah <laughs> but also, absolutely. also I think that you know one of the benefits of large organizations is the variety of roles that are available so mm. although I've been at Aviva for such a long time I've I've not really done the same job for more than a kind of two-year period mm. um and even then the the changes and the evolution to those roles has meant that it feels fresh and new mm. so being able to kind of move around different areas learn new things find out find you know turn over new stones and see what's underneath mm. Mm. um is brilliant there's plenty plenty enough to keep my interest and some fantastic people and some leaders that i aspire to um be like and learn from so yeah yeah it's a great think, place for me yeah and i think you know one of the things you said right at the beginning was that that questioning and always being mindful of you know I'm, I, I, the value that you add i think is really important as well i think you know i think it's it, it, it that's what that for what from my experience of working with you know i've worked in organizations where you know there's been a kind of mix of, of people and it's the people who've been there and a, and a, and a really adding massive amounts of value and, and that really using their experience who have that kind of humility to recognize that um just because they've been there for a for, for a long time or been there for a while doesn't mean then you know it goes back to one of your points is they don't know everything and they're always learning and that totally. willingness to learn and that humility i think is is a really important quality so bringing things to a close now normally i ask people to share something that I, I didn't know about them or maybe other people don't know that and you already divulged something to me but i'm going to let you tell us a little bit about <laughs> it because you, you you described yourself as a geek but then a geek with a particular interest in a particular area so sarah <laughs> tell us all about your what what is your particular geeky interest your, your, your uh, interest in in a particular thing that i think people will be interested to know about you anyway <laughs> well people who've met me wouldn't be too surprised to know this um yeah. but i um i am a geek and um i do have an awful lot of tattoos 
fantastic. <laughs> I think it's still quite unusual in in sort of big corporate land to be reasonably heavily tattooed. Um, and yeah, fascinating some of the the comments from you know family members like um you know oh do you need to put that on your cv will you have to wear kind of long long sleeve t-shirts in the office and um i think it's just something that for me um tattoos are just art they're yeah. beautiful pictures that i like to look at and that make me happy and that i'm really happy to have on me um so yeah it fascinates me that Fantastic. it's different different people's opinions to what that might do for your career yeah but. yeah <laughs> and, 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 I, and as I said told you, you know, before we, we started recording my brother's a tattooist so I'm very open-minded about tattoos and my daughter's just had it she's just 18 and she's had a couple done recently and, and I really I think they're, they're amazing she designed them herself she's she's, she's an artist well she, nice. she's studying art uh, a level art and uh, and she designed them and had them you know, met somebody who she wanted to do them and briefed him and found out there was a meeting of minds and, and what he's done is amazing and what she designed was amazing. So I think I, I, I completely... So what's your, what is your, your without asking too personal a question, what's your favourite ta- <laughs> tattoo? Have you got any, any tattoo that you're, you're particularly proud of or, or and if so, what is it? And if it's not too forward to ask where it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, interesting the, what you mentioned about your daughter. So I absolutely believe that because there are you should look for artists that you like yeah um so whatever you've got in your head find the person who does work like that yeah um and i love um all things kind of art nouveau i love the flow and nature um and there's a kingfisher tattoo that i've got which just sort of i found someone whose work i loved i said to him i'd really love a kingfisher in a sort of an art nouveau style yeah. And then I rocked up at his studio without having spoken to him. So all that was done by email. Yeah. Um, and the drawing he showed me was just like perfect, better yeah. than I could have sketched or imagined. And that just really made me think that's the way to do it. You know, find someone yeah. who's art you love and yeah. it will it will be beautiful. So, yeah, my yeah. Kingfisher is my favourite by far. Fantastic. Well, that's that's brilliant. No, that's lovely. I think that's a really nice way to to, to bring things to a close. A really unique and 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 uh, distinctive way, which I think you've you've kind of embodied in, in everything that you've you've talked about um, today, Sarah. So, um, I, I, if people want to connect with you, reach out to you, tap into this wisdom further. Uh, I guess LinkedIn, <laughs> LinkedIn is is that the, probably the easiest way for people to get in touch with you? If we put a link into you, a link in the show yeah. notes to your LinkedIn profile, you're happy for people to say hello and I just heard you on the Absolutely. podcast and I'd love to know a little bit more about this. Yeah, fantastic. Always and, up for swapping ideas and knowledge. Brilliant. And do you use any, any other social media? Are you a Twitterer or are you, uh, you anywhere, any other, uh, but is that more for personal stuff if you do rather than professional? Uh, yeah, I yeah. Hide, uh, I'm not good at, at um, Twitter. I quite like <laughs> to kind of curate my own happy little place on um, social media and I don't find Twitter's very conducive to that. So yeah, yeah LinkedIn is the best one. For best me, way so. to reach out to you. Yeah, lovely. And yeah. I can see you uh, looking at your profile and, and, uh, and you do interact and I can see you engage and share a lot of stuff on site. That sounds like a good way to get in touch. Well, look, Sarah, it's been absolutely fantastic talking. It was an absolute delight listening to to your stories and, and, and your, your, your wisdom there. And I think we've had a really good conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, I wish you all the best. Um, obviously, we see in this sort of post pandemic and final ends of the pandemic and whatever we come out with the pandemic, but also going forward in, in, in the future with your career. And I hope everything, uh, you know, you know, Aviva is, is good and your people are all safe and, and well, and, and that uh, business returns to some sense of normality as quickly as possible for you. Oh, thanks so much, Craig. It's been really brilliant. I've loved talking to you. You've been very kind. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sarah. And, and uh, take care. Thanks. So thank you for listening to Engaging Internal Comms. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the show and any questions, ideas or feedback that you'd have. Anything you'd like us to cover on future episodes too, please. So you can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can get in touch with us via the contact form at engagingic.com. You can also sign up to our mailing list there 
and we'll send you relevant news about the show and anything that we think you might be interested in when it comes to internal communications and employee engagement. If you like the show and you haven't already done so, please subscribe to it directly via your podcast service. Uh, And you can also subscribe via the links on our podcast page, which again is engagingic.com. If you like the show, we'd be really grateful if you could leave us a review um, and also if you could leave some verbal uh, feedback there as well, not just stars. That's always nice to know that we, we've been appreciated and particularly how we're, we've helped you. If you know anyone else who might like the show or might benefit from it, please tell them, please share it with them. Please share the link to our website, engagingic.com. And uh, that would be great because we want to grow our community. community. We want to get as many people involved in the show as possible. Um, And we, uh, yeah, the, the bigger, the better. Okay, thank you.